Ah, the magical world of Disney. So much goes on offstage and behind the scenes to ensure that the guests have the most magical times of their lives once they arrive on the property. Ever seen a wet paint sign while walking through one of the parks? How about a maintenance cast member with a bag of tools? Anyone with a construction hard hat? Of course you haven't. That would ruin the experience and Walt Disney World is perfection. It's because of that that 99.99% of all the work goes on after the show is over. All the little mice that keep the place running like clockwork don't even start working until the announcement is made over the radios we carry that the park is now clear. Then the crews get to work. Maintenance starts buzzing around on their golf carts. The custodial cast members bring out all the large hoses to wash down every inch of the streets we all walk on. And the construction crews are allowed past the security gates to come in and do whatever needs to be done. That's where my story begins. I've worked construction most of my life. When work dried up up north, I moved to Florida where some of my family had moved over 10 years ago. Naturally, I needed to find a job. I wound up applying for, and getting hired by a construction company that shall remain nameless, that literally did almost all of the construction needs for the corporate mouse. I spent five or six overnights a week at various locations at Walt Disney World with co-workers. We weren't employed by Disney, hence we were not cast members, doing whatever our foreman told us needed to be done. Sweet gig, actually, even though it was very hard work at times. Just think, how many people can truly say that they get to ride around Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, etc. in the dead of night in trucks, golf carts, what have you, while the park is just about empty, except for the skeleton crew. For about the first six months, I kind of kept to myself, except for talking with the crew of the company that I worked for. Then I began noticing how chummy many of the Disney overnight crew was with our staff. Custodians, when working in the same areas as us, would come and talk to the boys as well as the overnight security cast members. I began to slowly get to know many of these folks as well. They, for the most part, were really nice. I got to know many of the night security staff, by phase at least, at all four parks as well as the resorts. If you didn't know, Walt Disney World opened in 1971. It was actually not too uncommon to come across someone who had been a lifer with Disney, or knew someone who was. 40 plus years working for the mouse, God bless him. Even my foreman, who although did not work directly for Walt Disney World, was one of these. Boy, did they have some stories to tell to pass the time. As I adjusted more to the job, I began to get more comfortable with my surroundings. The cast members grew more social towards me, and I was able to make my way through the parks without getting lost too. Let me tell you, that is not an easy feat when you first start at working there, especially at night. Although it's not pitch black, there is very minimal lighting except for when we put our floodlights up to do our work. Security is only using flashlights or the headlight of their carts to light their ways, and store lights are only on if someone is working in them. Quite eerie, and yet cool at the same time. It's like a totally different place than during operating hours. As a matter of fact, one time, when I decided to visit the park as a guest, I couldn't find a ride that I wanted to go on because it looked so different during the day with all the colors, people, sounds, and music. One year of working at the place full time and I had to swallow my stupid pride and get a map. <laughs> Pathetic. Anyway, as I started conversing more and more with the cast members, some of the security staff and I found out that we had a mutual interest in the paranormal. Of course, that would come up in conversation eventually when working graveyard shifts. I would get to hear stories from them all the time. The famous ghost in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. The murder-suicide in one of the rooms of a certain resort. The jumping off of terraces in another. Ghosts of cast members who have passed on and come back to say hi. The spooky occurrences at rides where some unfortunate guest was killed. The stories went on and on. Although fun to hear, I won't lie, it did give the whole property an ominous feel at times that a guest will never get to experience. Even co-workers of mine had stories to tell, attractions turning on even though the lockout tagout system was in place to ensure that they didn't. Following someone to a break room, and walking in to find no one in there. 
And of course, the noises and voices when they were working alone. So, several months ago when arriving at work, the foreman called our team over for a meeting. He announced that we would be starting a new assignment in the Magic Kingdom. We would be working on the Seven Dwarves Mine train ride. This attraction would be opening later in the year. This was actually really exciting. Up until now, my crew, since I had started with them, had been doing mundane yet necessary assignments. We had the pleasure of pouring concrete, digging ditches, fixing bathrooms, good stuff. Now, we were actually going to get to work on an attraction. Imagine me getting to tell my future wife and children that I helped make this as we were riding it. They would be in awe and so proud. The building was already up for the most part, and we were going to be working on making it show ready. You know, making a building look like a mine inside and out. Fabricating rocks, fixating jewels, the works. When the time came to start this, he had us meet in one of the cast members' break rooms inside the attraction. For those that don't know, most, if not all attractions have break rooms inside of them that the public can't see. A cast member working the ride literally doesn't have to leave if he or she doesn't want to, even for a lunch break. He explained the job, who would be doing what each week, all the normal details. Then he proceeded to tell us that as per Disney management, we were to take all of our lunch breaks at 3am, and to only take it in this particular break room we were in. I thought of this as kind of weird. Since my employment with them began, we were never told when and where to take lunch. We would usually stagger our breaks as well so that most of the crew was always working. Whatever, I guess. The mouse paid our bills and who the hell was I to question it? I was still the rookie, but I will say this. I saw what I was thinking in the eyes of my coworkers as well. We were only a group of 10 guys on this assignment and we were broken up into two groups of five. One group would work on the outside and one group on the inside of the attraction. I was in the inside group. It was a pain to work in that thing. Due to the size of the spaces where we had to work, maybe one or two floodlights would fit in an area where we were working. It gave an effect of staring into a fire in the woods. While working on a wall, it was bright as hell. When you came out of that space, you were as blind as a bat. It became a contest. Whoever tripped the most and broke their ass each week had to pay for the drinks when we went out together. I paid up twice the first month. Thanks, Disney. I guess you could call me paranoid, but I would never leave my lunch bag in the fridge in the break room. I am an absolute angry asshole if I get hungry, and after having it stolen once at Animal Kingdom, I was not going to have it happen again. So I just carried it with my other gear from then on. We were working on the opposite side of the attraction from the break room, and it was just about lunchtime. We cleaned up all the possible trip hazards and went on break. When we got to the break room, I realized I had left my bag where we were working. Damn it! There was no way I was spending $8 on a Coke and a stupid bear claw from one of Disney's rip-off vending machines. I told the guys I was going to run back and get my bag. So, off I went. I was hurrying along because we only get a half hour for lunch and if we take even a minute longer to get back to our work location, there is hell to pay. And you all know how fast a half hour flies by, unless you're working. Trying to make good time, I must have made a wrong turn in all that blackness. My stupid flashlight was in my tool bag, of course. I was attempting to feel my way around the track when I saw some light coming up ahead of me. They looked like they could be a set of emergency lights, but they were quite dim and flickering. Who cares? Any port in a storm, right? I slowly made my way towards them began to hear voices, but I couldn't make out any words. There was no one in the attraction other than us, or so we were told. Oh my god, after all the stories I was told, was I finally going to have one of my own? As much as I felt the hairs on my neck stand up, I was excited as well. Even though I really like hearing about ghosts, I can't say that I am really, truly afraid of them. I just don't want them in my home. Other than that, I find the idea of them fascinating. I slowly peek my head around the next corner. I wish to God that it was a ghost I saw. 
It was a large, at least compared to where we were working, open space, and there was a fabricated stone slab made to look like a natural rock formation in the center. Six figures in suits were around it in a circle. Five were holding candles, while one was reading off of what looked like an old piece of parchment. What he was saying was beyond my knowledge. Not English from what I could hear. Every time the main suit would finish a sentence or two, the others would repeat the last word. As I crouched there amazed, I saw what looked like a flash of yellow and blue stirring from the top of the altar. There was someone on it. A woman. She stirred again, and I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. It looked like one of the college program kids, completely dressed as Snow White. She was gagged and bound. What the hell was I seeing? Her eyes were huge and filled with fright. Tears were streaming down her face, making her overly done makeup run. As much as she struggled, she could barely move. The man with the parchment stopped reading. The others all produced some crudely made daggers and made their way to her. Two of them went to each of her arms, two to her legs, and one stood at the top of her head. The leader, for lack of a better word, made a gesture with his hands and said one more uncomprehendable word, and the others moved in. The first two sliced her arms from mid-bicep down to the wrists. The two others did the same from mid-thigh to the tops of her feet. The fifth one actually carved what looked like a half moon into her forehead. I stifled a scream and closed my eyes. I could hear muffled screams and smell copper in my nostrils and taste it in the back of my throat. I opened my eyes briefly to see the leader produce a knife, walk over to the top of the altar, and lift poor Snow White's chin up towards him. That's when I turned and ran. I got back to the break room sprinting through the door. I must have looked half crazed because one of my buddies said, What the hell happened to you and, and where's your lunch bag? I didn't even answer him, I just stood there. He looked me over one more time and decided to call the foreman over the radio to come talk with me. The foreman came in, took one look at me and asked if I was feeling okay. I shook my head. He told me to go home for the remainder of my shift. I called in sick for the next three days. In the comfort of my home, I attempted to rationalize what had happened. It had to be a gag, right? Was it my boys with an elaborate welcome to the crew trick? I mean, <laughs> Walt Disney World is crammed full of college program kids. Late teens and early 20 year olds, away from home and college getting paid crap just so they can put Disney on their resumes. Just fornicating and causing havoc every chance they get? Playing tricks so they can put it on their blogs or Twitter or whatever other stupid things they use to get attention? Had to be. On my first night back to work, I literally had to force myself not to turn my car around at the security gate when the guard opened it for me to enter. When I got to the break room, one of the lifers I worked with was sitting there seemingly waiting for me. He told me to clock in, leave my stuff with him, and go meet the foreman over by the main entrance. I looked at him quizzically since it was pretty far from where the mine was and it was heavily frowned upon for us non-cast members to be found wandering far from where we were assigned. I stated as such and he just said, You'll be with your boss so it would be his ass and not yours if someone says something. I made my way over to the main entrance and found him under the train station sitting on one of the benches. He told me to have a seat. We sat there for about five minutes without speaking. He lit up a cigarette, and I did as well. During the night shift, you could get away with this if you were careful about it. He asked what had happened to me the other night. I just shrugged, looked at the newly hosed down ground, and exhaled. He put his hand on my shoulder and said that I was a great coworker. The other guys all liked me a lot, and that he didn't want to lose me. He said he was surprised I came back after the way I had looked. I told him that that wasn't far from the truth. He asked me if I was just sick, or if something had happened. He also asked me if maybe a cast member manager had given me a hard time, and if so, he'd handle it. I shook my head and said that he wouldn't believe me and probably would fire me for being a nut if I told him. 
He then said something that made me feel as if it was okay to tell my story. He said, I've worked here since it was just flat land and dirt roads. Nothing you say can shock me. I looked up at him, dead in the eyes. When I saw that he was telling the truth, I began to explain everything from the beginning. I ended the story when the other guy told me to come see him. My foreman sat there, flicked his cigarette butt, and grounded into the pavement. A huge Disney no-no. He had sat there nodding through my entire story, not interrupting me once, never once a smirk, a smile, a look of disbelief. A custodial truck happened to drive by, and when the headlights flashed on us, I had seen that all the blood had seemed to drain from my foreman's face. He breathed in and exhaled once, from the mouth. He had the beginnings of tears in his eyes. He finally spoke. What I'm about to tell you, kiddo. Not many here have been here long enough to know, and those who do know, almost never speak about it. It's sort of a taboo subject, and the few that do talk about it are too old to care, or have had one too many scotches. He smiled half-heartedly at this, and I thought maybe he might stop. But he continued. I have lived in this area for almost 80 years. I have barely been out of this state, less times than I can count on one hand. And Orlando has only looked this way for a short time. If you could have seen this land in the time I grew up here, you would be amazed. Marshland and orange groves, nothing else. Until Uncle Walt decided this was the spot for his next incredible theme park. There was practically nothing. Humans have been inhabiting this land for a very long time. The Ace, the Apalachi, the Calusa, the Timucua, the Tugabago. All native Indians that lived in or around the land you are sitting on right now. The Paleo Indians were here before them. Ancient lands. Well, I'm no historian. But I guess some Indians at some point figured out this land was a little spoiled. Uh, spoiled as in not just bad, but spoiled as in how a little child throws a tantrum if it doesn't get its way. At some point, when these cultures were not having good weather or crops, what have you, they figured out that a blood sacrifice would do the trick. And every time they built a large structure in this area, they drew blood. But for whatever reason, the sacrifice had to do with the structure being built. Uh, for example, if the Indians were building a religious structure, a shaman had to be sacrificed. If a settler was building a barn or an orange grove, a farmhand had to be the one, you get me? And it had to be done by the elders of the town. Couldn't be done by just anyone. But the elders or most influential ones in the area. Uh, you ever seen that movie Pet Cemetery by Stephen King? It's like that. Uh, but the important people involved. Do you know the story about Disney buying this land? He bought it not under the Disney brand, but hundreds of pseudo companies. He didn't want anyone to know he was going to build a theme park here. Because the locals may not have sold as cheaply as they did. So he did what he did. I wonder if, through all this half-truth bargaining, if him or his roundtable executives ever wondered why so many were willing to sell at that price. Were they done having to do the despicable to make a profit here? Did many of them want out? It can really make you wonder. And how come supposedly no one dies at Disney? And how come all people are proclaimed dead off the property? And why do we hire so many college kids that are supposedly running rampant here? Think about it. You know, I just gotta tell you because I think you may deserve it after you've seen what you claim to. The powers that be here are powerful. More powerful than just being Disney executives. 
They pretty much rule everything. You think Club 33 is exclusive? <laughs> the club you stumbled upon rules more than just a theme park. If you talk about what you've seen, your life may be in danger. I just sat there, trying to soak in what I had just heard. This was insane. And then my foreman said one more thing before the last sentence I ever said to that nice man. If you think that was bad, just imagine what I heard as we were building It's a Small World. I swear I still hear those screams of those kids once I close my eyes at night. Forty years after. My reply? I quit. Ah, the magical world of Disney. I still get the shakes when I think about it. I hate every fucking Disney commercial that comes on TV. And they come on a lot. I get goosebumps every time. I see that Universal is hiring, and I need work. Should I apply?